Shalom, shalom, everyone. Shalom, shalom. Welcome back. Welcome back. We finally back coming with another video. And as you can tell by the title, man, Untold Histories, African Royals and European Traders. Today, we will be taking a deeper look into the history of the slave trade and the roles that certain peoples played in it in particular. Um, throughout the history, we've only been told it one side of the slave trade, in my point of view. And even when I talk to different peoples throughout the community, they don't seem to have a full understanding of what went on and the things that happened during that time. So in order to find that out and in order to bring that out, we will have to do a little reading today. So um, I hope you all are ready to read, um, follow through. Uh, all the sources and information will be in the video. You can look it up if you need to or reach out to me if you need the documentation. But again, we're about to get started. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the chat. And again, shalom to everybody that's tuning in in the chat and that will be tuning in later. So let me go ahead and pull this up and we're going to get started. OK, so a deeper look again, a deeper look into the untold histories of the African royals and European traders. So we're going to have to get a little background history on the Europeans going into Western Africa before we get started on the main points of the video. And to do that, we're going to go to the Portuguese in West Africa, all right, the Portuguese in West Africa. And we're going to start at the top of the second paragraph, where it reads off the Infante Dom Henrique had held the right to license and tax traders going to West Africa. But after his death in 1460, the crown's interest in Africa and the islands declined. The Cape Verde and Guinea Islands were granted to the captains and the rights to trade in West Africa was leased to Fernando Gomez, a Lisbon merchant. The interests of Alfonso V were clearly and explicitly focused on Morocco and latterly in trying to secure the throne of Castile. It was his bid for the Castilian throne that led to the war from 1474 to 1479. During that war, the Castilians organized fleets to trade in West African waters and to challenge the Portuguese occupation of the Cape Verde Islands. The danger was perceived to be so great that the king appointed his son, the Infante Dom Joe. And if you all are familiar with my channel, this is also um, King John of Portugal during that time. So Infante Dom Joy is also known as King John um, to take control of all the West African enterprises. Joy did not only provide effective in fighting off the Castilian challenge, but devised a cohort st strategy for a more direct exploitation of the economic or economic opportunities in Western Africa. So this was their main goal in seizing or capturing these lands or going to these lands within West Africa was to exploit the economic opportunities in these lands. It continues, so successful was he in the first of these that when the peace of Alcavacas or Alcavos was negotiated with Castile in 1479, Portugal was able to write into the agreement clauses recognizing its sovereignty in four of the five islands groups so far discovered. And if you're familiar with this time period, we know that the Portuguese claimed to discover Islands like Sao Tome, Cape Verde, islands off the western coast of Africa, and also the Canary Islands. It continues on saying, as well as its exclusive rights to control West African trade. Only in the Canary Islands did Portugal have to abandon its claims in favor of Castile. Having secured for Portugal exclusive rights to trade in West African waters, Don Joel, who became king in 1481, decided to build a fortified settlement in the center of the gold trading region and to make the gold trade a royal monopoly. The fortress of Elmina, which is in Ghana, which was established by Diago or Diogo de Azambuja in 1482, was not like the Moroccan fortress in that it was not intended to be a base for raiding the surrounding country or a launching pad for conquest. It was a trading factory whose fortifications were aimed primarily at discouraging other European or even other subjects of the Portuguese crown from breaching the trading monopoly. So we started getting to 
Portugal bring, bringing their way into Western African societies, and they eventually made a fortified settlement in Ghana. So let's continue to get into that. Continuing on to page 10, it reads, Don Joa also pursued a policy of making alliances with important African rulers. So these European traders were coming into Western Africa and making alliances with them. This would be cemented where possible by the conversion of the ruler to Christianity, thereby enabling trade to expand and rivals to be kept at bay. The king's third objective was to find a sea passage to India and to ensure that such a vital strategic or strategy discovery will be made by Portugal and not by any of its rivals. A number of traders had already made direct contact with African rulers. So this was common, these European traders making contact with these African rulers. And it goes on to say, and Cod Moscow, friendly and inquisitive account of his dealings with the rulers of Senegambia, featured in Doc 16 and 17. Dom Joe, however, wanted such contacts to be made whenever possible between two rulers. So when he heard that Diago Cor, a captain in his service, had established relations with a powerful king who controlled the land of the southern bank in, of Zaire, Eastery, it became one of his priorities to turn this discovery into a firm alliance. In this specific place, Zaire, we know this was associated with the Kingdom of Congo. The embassy of 1491 had consequences that must have been an, excuse me, the embassy of 1491 had consequences that must have been as unexpected as they were gratifying. The ruler of the coastal province of Sonyo, which is also in the Kingdom of Congo, and latter the king himself eagerly embraced Christianity and allowed a group of Portuguese who included priests among their number to establish themselves in the country. So this was what was really going on during this time. Um, these African rulers were allowing these things to happen. And of course, they was agreeing to it. And to harper on that or to go into that a little more deeply, we actually have depictions of these European priests or missionaries in the kingdom of Congo um, with the Congo Christians, the Congo or the Congolese that converted to Christianity during this time. And as the depiction reads, this watercolor, um, depicts a Christian wedding ceremony in the kingdom of Congo, circa 750, which is exactly what we just read over. The Portuguese wanting to establish alliances with these African kings by way of Christianity. And here's a, here's a clear-cut example of one of those. And here's another picture where it shows us a Christian burial. The African, um, the African powers have placed offerings before the tomb, demonstrating a blend of Christianity and local traditions. But let's continue on, and we're going to read Africa's natural resources and undevelopment, and we're going to start to get a little bit more deeper into what we're trying to review here. And of course, we're going to start at the highlighted. It says, long before the Portuguese landed in parts of what we have or what have become modern-day Ghana in 1471, Gold from the forest region, specifically the Ashanti Empire, and other parts of West Africa formed the backbone of Western European banking and economic systems. European gold coins, which were the foundation of then, or uh, excuse me, of the then European economy, economy and banking system, carried an embossed image of West African elephants because the coins were minted out of Ashanti slash Akan. Go so long before 1471, you had trade between the West Africans, like the Ashanti and the Europeans, because we know during this time that the Portuguese specifically used their gold coins from the gold in Western Africa from the Akan. So, again, these people had relationships before the slave trade and they had trading relations before the slave trade. Continuing on to the next page. From 1471 onward, the Portuguese continued to arrive on the West African Guinea coast on the Atlantic side at the Gold Coast settlement, which they named Elmina, Portuguese word for mine, because of the gold they found there on the 19th January of 1482. This was also when Nana Kawani Anashe 
or Anash of Elmina granted the Portuguese who were led by Don Diego land to build the Elmina fort. So it was actually an Akan man or the Akan who granted the Portuguese the land to build the fort. It continues on to say, this will become not only the first real estate transaction between Africans and Europeans on African soil, but also one which was to have severe repercussions beyond Africa. Because as we know, this later went on to flourish or lead to the transatlantic slave trade. So before we move on, let me check out the chat, see if there's anything in there. Okay, we don't have anything right now, so let's continue on. So, so far we've been learning about mainly or focusing on the Elmina note and how the Portuguese and these other European traders came into West Africa and was granted this land by the African rulers in this area. So let's get into that. All right, let's go further into the Elmina note. And to do that, we're gonna go to the Elmina note, myth and, reli myth and reality in the Santi Dutch relations, all right? And we're going to start at the very top. It reads, one of the more perplexing issues in the history of Ashanti relations with the Europeans of the 19th century Gold Coast has been that of the origin of, and the significance of the so-called Elmina note. Excuse me, let me go back in. All right. It says, the pay document which authorized the Ashanti to collect two ounces of gold per month from the Dutch authorities at Elmina. Again, the Elmina note, the pay document which authorized the Ashanti to collect two ounces of gold per month from the Dutch authorities at Elmina. Not only have modern historians of Ghana evidence no small of conclusion of this matter, but during 1870-1871, the Ashanti the British and the Dutch also disagreed strongly over the political significance of the note as the Dutch negotiated to cede their positions or possessions on the Gold Coast to the British. Failure to resolve these disagreements contributed significantly to the Ashanti decision to invade the British protected territories in 1873. This action in turn led to the British invasions of Ashanti in 1874 which most historians agree con constitutes a critical watershed in Ashanti history. Clearly, the matter of the Elmina note is one of his, or excuse me, is one of some historical and historiographical importance. An examination of the relevant Dutch, Danish, and British documents now make possible a resolution of the majority or the major questions concerning its origins and meanings. The debate between the Ashanti the British and the Dutch shows that in the latter 19th century, there was considerable or considerable agreement over certain issues. First, no one disputed that the Dutch had for some time past paid the Ashanti a stipend of two ounces per month or 24 ounces per year. All right. So there was no disputing that the Europeans actually did pay the Ashanti monthly or yearly to hold their fort on their land. Secondly, all parties agreed that the Dutch began to practice this early in the early 18th century following the defeat of, this name is extremely hard to pronounce, but of Dinkirining by Ashanti forces under Asitutu. As Ashanti Kofi Kakari put it in a letter to the English governor, the fort of the place Elmina have for a time and morally pay an annual tribute to my ancestors to present time by rights of arms when we conquered in team King of Dinkra. Again, the fort of the place of Amina have from in time and morally paid an annual tribute to my ancestors to the present time by right of arms when we conquered a team King of Dinkra. Continuing, a team having purchased goods to the amount of 9,000 pounds from the Dutch and not paying for them before we conquered the team, the Dutch demanded of my father, Asi Tutu I, to, for the payment who paid it in full, and the Dutch delivered the Elmina to him as his own. 
When asked by the English to respond to his claim, Dutch Governor C. Nactaglas did not dispute that his government had long paid the Ashanti inciting tradition. He allowed that the practice begun, or he, yes, he allowed that the practice begun when the king of Ashanti conquered the Dinkras and the pay note came into his hands. What the Dutch governor rejected was the claim that such payment constituted tribute as the Ashanti asserted. So the only thing the Dutch governor disagreed with with this whole Elmina note was that it was a tribute, meaning that they just laid down to the Ashanti and was just paying them ransom to be there. He's basically saying that it was agreement between both of them opposed to a tribute, right? So let's see, let's see. Should we continue reading on? Yes, let's continue reading on. It says, rather, in the Gal in Nactalga's view, the Kosked was a mere gift to promote the trade with the natives of the interior. So that was, in his view, that was a view or that was a gift to promote the trade with the natives in the interior. There was, of course, more than European pride involved here. And the Dutch paid tribute to the Ashanti in respect of their occupation of the fort at Amina. Then by what right could they cede their forts to the British? Ultimately, as is well known, the Ashanti issued a certificate of apology withdrawing his claim of the overlordship of, over Amina. Though some historians dispute the document authenticity, but whatever the validity of the certificate, more on this below, it must be remembered that the Ashantini continued to object to the transfer of his allies, the people of the town of Amina to the British. And during this specific time, the people of the town of Elmina would have been the Fon people who inhabited the coast. It continues on to say, indeed, a year after the secession took place, he ordered an army to the coast to assist the Elminas in, attempt, in attempting forcibly to eject the British from the old Dutch fort. Continuing, looking back on these events, the colonial generation of the Gold Coast historians, A.B. Ellis, W.W. Clardich, and W.E.F. Ward, tended to find merit in the arguments of Kofi Kari. As Claridge wrote, Dutch payments to Ashanti or Ashanti of a yearly stipend naturally implied an admission on part of the Dutch that the Ashantis had the right to the ground of which their castle stood. More recently, historians have less charitably to the late 19th century Ashanti perspective. Douglas Combs made an extensive examination of the Dutch and British archival sources for the period between 1850 and 1872 and argued for a position between what he termed the extremes of the Dutch and the Asante view of the, uh, of the Kostegid relationship or the Elmina note or the stipend that they was paying. He argued was probably founded on a misunderstanding intending or intended in one sense by the Europeans and it was accepted in a very different way by the Africans. So this specific historian believed that the agreement between them was intended one way by the Europeans and understood in a different way by the Africans, which is also possible. So what we're gonna do now is take a look at African societies and their role within a trade, all right? And again, shalom, shalom, brother G. Nice to see you back in the chat. So to continue on, we're going to read from the book, An Archaeology, or An Archaeology of Elmina. And we're going to start at the first highlighted sentence we see. It states, during the 17th century, slaves replaced gold as the primary export from the Gold Coast. All right, slaves replaced gold as the primary export from the Gold Coast. The timing, reason, and implications of the shift have been the subject of extensive scholarship. At the core of a variety of economic, social, and political transformations were the labor requirements of the emerging plantation system in the Americas. These developments had important consequences in West Africa. Prior to the 17th century, European coastal trade was essentially the same as that of the Trans-Saharan and Indian Ocean systems which had begun centuries earlier. 
The items involved consisted of many commodities and luxury items from which there was already a demand. African gold was exchanged for metal goods, coral shells, clothing, and beads. The volume of trade was dependent on European production and supply of capabilities, as well as African trade and distribution networks. Initially, African economies remained self-sustained and largely functioned independently. The slave trade, however, increasingly immense the African economies that supplied the slaves in many instances throughout raiding. All right, let me read that again. The slave trade, however, increasingly diminished the African economies that supplied the slaves in many instances through raiding. Continuing. The historical and archaeological data that are available are insufficient. Excuse me, are insufficient. This part is, excuse me, because this part is being blocked off on the screen yard. I'm going to just skip this part. It says the historical and archaeological data that are available are insufficient, fully the consequences of the slave trade on African populations. The majority of the documentary sources and hence much of the history of the topic focus on the coastal ports through which enslaved Africans pass, not on their actual ethnic origins. Understanding the African impacts as well as the cultural heritage of Africans in the diaspora is dependent on much fuller knowledge of developments in the vast hinterland of Africa from which the slaves were drawn. What is clear is that the impact of the trade on the trade varied in individual society or social, cultural, and historical settings. Some societies were directly involved in slave procurement and trading, whereas others were extensively raiding or raided for slaves. Again, some societies were directly involved in slave procurement and trading, whereas others were extensively raided for slaves. All right. So again, we start to see that after, you know, the, 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 the trade of gold and other things started to die down in West Africa, that was replaced by African slaves, by the people that was trading them. But let's continue to get more information on that. And to do that, we're going to look at um, an example of tribes or clans that actually indulge in this slave trade, all right, in these agreements. And to do that, we're going to look at the Igbo, all right? And to do that, we're going to look at the Igbo, a specific group amongst the Igbo known as the Oro, all right? So the Igbo Oro Confederacy is what we're going to look at now. To do that, we're going to look at the book Murder at Monte Pillar, Igbo Africans in Virginia. And of course, we're going to start at the highlighted section at the bottom. It reads... The structure of the export trade in slaves from Calabar, in which Igbo Zai's coastal big men brokered exchanges between newly arrived European captains and their agents, and a series of Igbo speaking headmen in the interior villages or slave specialists, such as the Aro, combined with particular social and political changes in the broad region to make Igbo peoples the Calabar coast principal source population of slaves, all right? So again, these Igbo coastal big men brokered the exchanges of slaves with the newly arriving European captains. And a lot of these peoples that specifically done this in the Igbo nation or people was the Oro group, the Oro tribe or the Oro clan. It says by the 1720s or 1720s, Tens, at the latest, local slavers reach extended relatively far inland. Their alliances with intermediaries, especially the fiercer interred Aro traders and their allies who were protected in their travels by the divine sanction of the supreme deity, Chukwu, and, their, and hence called themselves Umu Chukwu, which of course is children of God, enabled the slavers to conduct captives along formal paths and roads to the heads of the creeks and lagoons flowing to the coastal towns. Hailing from the Oracle of Orochukwu, 
The Oro and their dependents relied on the muscle of their armed porters as much as their reputation for retribution. The Oro established a series of settlements throughout the Igbo heartland in the middle of decades of the century and ran major and minor fairs at larger villages all across Igbo land in the 18th and 19th centuries. The slave trade out of Calabar reached further inland over the centuries. In the 17th century, individual Calabari and associated coastal villages apparently had raided each other for slaves, all right? So this is really what was going on during this time period. One village, perhaps apocryphal, called Agbani, or Bilal, or Beli, was remembered as the most disruptive and warlike in this initial phase of violence accumulation. One anthropologist has read in that in this early period, Bio got its slaves by sacking neighboring Delta villages rather than by trade with the hinter, with the hinterland. All right. So again, Bio got its slaves by sacking neighboring Delta villages rather than trade with the hinterland. All right. So they was just going into different villages on the Nile, or excuse me, not the Nile, but the Niger Delta, and just ransacking their villages, man. And of course trading them along and passing them on to the European traders um, on the coast. We're going to read one more source over the Igbos and their uh, role in the slave trade. And to do that, we're going to go to the physical anthropological of Southern Nigeria, a biometric study in statistical method. And of course, we're just going to read from the highlighted section in this source. It reads, although large numbers of Igbo were exported as slaves from Bani or Calabar and the other oil river ports, these were not attained in slave raiding expeditions of wars, but were mostly debitors, criminals, those who had committed abominations in their village and other people whom their communities wish to be rid. And if you're familiar with the novels or the stories of Alua Equiano, he tells us the same thing, all right? He tells us that it was people or there was fellow Igbo men raiding their villages and capturing them and selling them off. And he also told us that they were selling off people who committed crimes, you know, people who committed abominations. So again, this is what was going on during this time. This is why this specific video is called The Untold Histories because again, I know a lot of us were not taught this and even a lot of people I speak to, they disagree with the notion that Africans were selling Africans. So to conclude, for the Africans enslaved by Europeans, slavery was much worse. No law or human consideration took into account their misery and their, excuse me, their misery and they were beasts of burden and non-human in the eyes of the European powers. Henrik Clark maintains that Europe took full advantage of wars, conflicts between West African nations and began purchasing the captives and prisoners of war as slaves, all right? And this is coming from the healing in the homeland Haitian voodoo tradition. I just wanna read that last green highlighted part again. Europe took full advantage of wars and conflicts between West African nations, and they began to purchase captives, all right? They purchased captives. They purchased prisoners of war, all right? And they purchased this from the African royals and African leaders. Ending the, or ending the slavery blame game by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. While we are familiar with the role played by the United States and the European colonial powers like Britain, France, Holland, Portugal, and Spain, there is very little discussion of the role Africans themselves played. And that role, it, it turns out, was a considerable one, especially for the slave trading kingdoms of West and Central Africa. These included the Akan and the Kingdom of Ashanti and what is now Ghana, which we mentioned, the Fawn of Dahomey, also known as the kingdom of Judah or Wida, right? The Mbundu of the Ndodo in Northern Angola and the Congo 
of today's Congo, among several other, others. For centuries, Europeans in Africa kept close to their military and trading posts on the coast. Exploration of the interior, home to the bulk of Africans sold into bondage at the heights of the slave trade, came only during the colonial conquest, which is why Henry Morton Stanley pursuit of Dr. David Livingston in 1871 made for such compelling press. He was going where no white man had gone before. And again, if you're familiar with my channel, we've read some of the works of Dr. David Livingston and how he was one of the only white man who traveled throughout the interiors of Africa during that time. Continuing. How did slaves make it to these coastal forts? The historian John Thornton and Linda Haywood of Boston University estimates that 90% of those shipped to the New World were enslaved by Africans and then sold to European slave traders. Okay, 90% of those shipped to the New World were enslaved by Africans and then sold to European traders. The sad truth is that without complex business partnership, between African elites and European traders and commercial agents, the slave trade in a new world would have been impossible, at least on the scale it occurred. The African role in the slave trade was successful, understood, and openly acknowledged by many African Americans even before the Civil War. Frederick Douglass, it was excuse me, Frederick Douglass, it was an argument against repatriation or repatriation schemes for free slaves. The savage chiefs of the West African or the Western coast of Africa, who for ages have been accustomed to selling their captives into bondage and pocketing the ready cash for them, would not more readily accept our moral and economic ideas than the slave traders of Maryland and Virginia, he warned. We are therefore less inclined to go back or go to Africa to work against the slave trade than to stay here and work against it. So he was basically saying there's really no point in going back to Africa because during that time they stood the likelihood of being sold back. For many African Americans, these facts can be difficult to accept, which is true. Excuses run through the garment for from Africans did not know how harsh slavery in America was, which is true they probably did and slavery in africa was by comparison humane or in a bizarre version of the devil made me do it africans were driven to this only by the unprecedented profits or profits offered by greedy european countries but the sad truth is that the conquest and capture of africans and their sale to europeans was one of the main sources of foreign exchange for several african kingdoms for a long time Slaves were the main export of the Kingdom of Congo, the Ashanti Empire of Ghana, exported slaves and used these profits to import gold. So this was what was going on. This was what was going on during the time. This was, was the way of the society. This is how these economies thrived and this is how they made their money during this time, unfortunately, right? So before I go ahead and play this video, to conclude, if there's any questions, comments, concerns, or anything, feel free to leave your um, feel free to leave them in the comment section because once this video is done playing, I will um, leave the flow open for questions, comments, or anything like that. And I will drop the link for anyone who wants to come up and join, ask any questions, add to, or anything like that. So I have a very important video to play that coincides with the information we just brought out. All right. The untold history, African royals and European traders. So let me see if I can bring this up. Let's see. I may have to share my full screen. So let's just do it that way. All right. So let's do this. I'm going to put myself on mute and we're going to play this video.
We are very privileged to be with you, particularly our brothers and sisters from the Caribbean and the diaspora. And the people from all over Africa, our brothers and sisters from all over Africa. I wish at this point to particularly to apologize deeply on behalf of the chiefs and people of Gold Coast and Ghana for the atrocities, the cruelty, the inhuman treatment that were committed 400 years ago by my ancestors during the Atlantic slave trade. Other news this evening, an apology for the slave trade from an unexpected place. Today, delegates from several African nations read apology letters from tribal leaders. Well, they say they're sorry for enslaving and trading fellow Africans to nations around the world. KSHB 41 News reporter Leslie Delisboer was there and shares their message of healing. Reaching across oceans. In song and with letters. It is very deep and uh, painful to even talk about it sometimes. Remembering the dark past and the role some African chiefs played in the slave trade. The apology of the awareness that there is a broad culture that contributed to this travesty of enslavement. This apology is directed specifically to people of, not people of color, black people, African people, people who have been dispersed in all parts of the world. Delegates from African countries extending a sincere apology for the actions of their ancestors. Some African chiefs in violation of their sworn duty to protect the interests of the people as well as those yet unborn and will kidnap, sell, trade and otherwise negotiate for the transfer of their own people to foreigners. Asking for forgiveness from their estranged African brothers and sisters. This opportunity today gives us a chance to have the most important of conversations that must happen between our people in addressing the transatlantic slave trade that forever changed people of African descent from continent to continent. Thinking about the past and its impact. When you can't, when you look at a black person and you can't know where they're from, that's that's the heartbreak of being a black American. Reflecting on the future. We have to face up to the things that we we are part of and understand why it happened. Because once we can do that, then we can move forward to the next level. Opening up a new chapter of love, life, and healing. I now know that they acknowledge, they being in Africa, acknowledge that I'm a sister, that I am a, a mother, that I am a descendant. And not separating me from the history, not separating my journey of 400 years just because I landed here. Ashe. In Kansas City, Kansas, Leslie Dallas for KSHB 41 News. We come in humility and brokenness to repent for the sins of the leaders in Africa and in particular, the sin of sending our own brothers and sisters into slavery. This great sin brought untold pain and misery to millions of people of African descent and judgment to the African people who remained on the continent. The grave sin of slavery scattered our people all over the face of the earth where they have suffered great deprivations and loss. If it were not for the part that our African kings and chiefs played in the slave trade, this evil trade could not have survived. Therefore, on behalf of all the African leaders, past and present, all of them, I acknowledge the part that we played in this tragedy 
And today we ask for forgiveness. We seek forgiveness for the great pain and loss that the myopic and selfish decisions of our leaders caused our brothers and sisters of African descent around the world, and we ask their forgiveness. We plead the blood of Jesus to cleanse us all from this great sin and release us from the spiritual, mental, emotional, and economic bondage it brought. Today, we reopen the door to our brothers and sisters of African descent to return home to the continent of Africa, the land of their ancestry, and the spiritual homeland of all African people. We welcome you home with open arms as brothers and sisters and pray that we can close the door to the dark past and work towards a better future. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. So need I say more on that specific topic? Need I say more? Um, we we reviewed a lot of information. So if you're just now tuning in, I advise you to start over. Um, we brought out the history of the Elmina note, which was between um, the Akans and other European traders coming in at the time. A gr agreement between them that the European traders can set up a fort on their land and, of course, trade from there. You know, that, of course, led to slaves being traded from the Elmina Castle. That's why it's such a major uh, historical slave site to this day. Um, we also reviewed the Kingdom of Congo converted to Christianity and also trading slaves. We looked at the Igbo, Oro Confederacy part in it as well. And again, we just reviewed a lot of history that has been untold and also unliked by those within the community. So at this point in the video, if there's any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to leave them. Um, I will be dropping another video here in the next few weeks, in the next week or two. So stay tuned for that. Um, and again, how has everyone been, man? What's going on with everyone? Just drop the link in the chat if anyone wants to come up for a minute. And again, I'll just stick around for a few minutes to see if there's any questions, comments, and or concerns. And again, shalom. Shalom to you. All right, shalom up. Shalom to everyone in the chat, man. Shalom, shalom. Hope everyone's been doing well and blessed. And I hope everyone enjoying their Shabbat day as well. But like I said, I have a few releases that I, or a few video ideas or topics I plan on releasing. Um, hopefully here soon we can talk about the genetic difference or the genetic makeup of African Americans. And also I have a vlog style type video <clears throat> that I'll be releasing where I visited one of my ancestors slave uh, plantations, all right? So we should be releasing that here soon in the next few weeks. And shalom, my brother, I've been pretty well. I've been pretty well grinding, focusing, trying to advance. How about yourself? How about yourself? Let's see, let's see. So we got a brother that came up on the stage. Let's see if I can add him on. Shalom, shalom, brother. Yohanan or Yohanan. Shalom, shalom. What's good, well? What's going on? Not much. So I got a question. So you know how it mentioned in the video about the slave trade and our ancestors, uh, you know, like uh, gave us away. So my question to you is, um, will there, like, so, you know, in the video, how they showed, like, you know, the Africans are saying that they're being held responsible for, um, they're taking accountability to what they're doing. Um, what can you see going on in the future? Do you think they'll really be accountable? And what about the sellouts that are still in Africa? In the future, I think there should be a more bridging of the gap 
we kind of see that now a lot of African Americans, Afro Caribbeans, or Afro descendants, period, are repatriating to the land and trying to bridge the gap. I think it'll just come with um, a conglomerate of things coming together. Like there has to be an um, educational um, thing going on, there has to be a financial thing going on, and there has to be something going on to where there is no greed between the two groups because even when people do repatriate back to Africa, you know, you got the good stories of the people who's living and thriving well. And then you also have those stories of the people who, you know, wish they was in America per se. Okay. I do think it's, right. I do think it's possible for it to be uh, a, a thriving thing between the dispersed and the non-dispersed on the continent. Okay. Yeah, because that that that's that's my main issue too, you know, like you know, there's a lot of sellouts in a lot of countries and you know how the government don't want black people to know what really happened. Uh this is why they hide certain information and certain ancient information from us because once we start to wake up, um they're gonna be shitting their pants. Um which would be, you know, higher elites that control the world, you know, not politicians, Rockefeller, Bill Gates, um, was it Queen Elizabeth and her family, Prince Harry, you know, people like that. And there's other um, people that are in other countries that are in Africa, you know, people that are in DR, higher up ministers in Brazil and, you know, all these people, you know, they're trying to make one world government. So, all right. Yeah, just, appreciate just you. About, yeah, no problem, bro. It's just about being morally better as a person or as a group because you know they they knew that wasn't morally right. I'm pretty sure they just wanted to you know grease their pockets. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they understood morally it wasn't right, or you know probably some of them did if they were selling people who were stealing or committing sins. You know what I'm saying? Or abominations, as they put it. Hell yeah, hell yeah, man. Hell man. We we are starting to wake up and know, you know, knowing our true identity, knowing our true history. And I think the government is getting worried now. And they and they, and they really should be, because once we find out the truth, you know, what are they gonna do? Are they gonna try to kill us all? I mean, they're already doing that with the foods, but you know, um yeah, bro. Yeah, I appreciate you, Will. Uh, Will, I'm gonna holla at you later. I got things to do, but I just want uh, my boy, yo, everyone in the chat, yo, shalom, shalom. <laughs> my boy Will, he's the goat of this, so please listen to him. Before you listen, to, I got to say this too. Before you listen to camps, anybody that's watching this in the future, before you listen to IUIC and all these other camps, you know, BHI, please, please, please watch his videos because some of the things he says, it debunks a lot of things what camp say they're in a lot of hatred they, they they they're like the modern day of hotel and like christianity like you know if you don't join iuic and them you know they deem you to hell and they tell you you don't love god and you know when you stop you know debunking their you know uh hypothesis about the slave trade like you know uh will son of yah does you know they you know they making threats and you know, one of the guys told him that he, he wished his brother in Christ would eat a bullet. You know what I mean? And I don't think it says anywhere in, in the Bible to tell your brother to eat a bullet or a rocket. You know, that's that's very disrespectful. And that's actually a demon. So please, guys, check this guy out. Know the real truth. Don't think inside the box. Think outside the box and, you know, escape the matrix. Shalom, everybody. Shalom, brother. I appreciate that. And let me just say this, too, before I answer this brother question, the brother Ezra. All of you all who leave comments, you know what I'm saying? Like, leave just random comments and things, just being mad, weird, and not understanding the context of the video. Stop doing that, all right? Because when I'm live, you, you're not tuning in. You're not engaging. And you're not asking questions, but once the video is posted, you come and you make assumptions about things I never stated in the video. 
That's how I know you didn't watch the video. Stop just reading the title, getting upset, and then coming without reading the video. Like, for example, I have, I promise it's thousands of comments of Bantus in one of the videos that I have um, breaking down the relationship between Bantus and West Africans. And almost every comment, you got a Bantu person saying, we don't come from West Africa. We don't come from West Africa. We don't come to West Africa. Well, if you watch the video, I never said you came from West Africa. You get what I'm saying? So just chill with all that. But how do you feel about the Sahel region breaking away from the Western influence, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger? I think it's a great move, and it's about time um, these African countries start to, you know, unite and stand up for themselves. Because once they do, then more than likely Africa will be become a worldwide powerhouse. Um, they will be like the new America, per se, or the, the new big country or continent because there's a lot of resources there there's, there's a lot of people there's a lot of land to become a you know a giant and we have another brother on g let's add him to the stage shalom shalom yo what up will what's going on my brother not much always uh appreciating your work as everyone else on the channel i'm sure you know appreciate it hey this is what i wanted to uh, i wanted to ask you uh you know about the Ebe tribe yes i do i do how how valid or how much do you believe uh their story on on uh the uh paleo hebrew of the uh, pronunciations of certain words like uh because they claim that a uh, hebrew in uh as it's written in the uh oldest scriptures is pronounced uh ivri i v r i mm -hmm. and i think i believe them what I would say to that, because it's a lot of tribes that say the same thing, but what I would say to that is that it's more than likely or it could be that remnants of the original language that they spoke, you know what I'm saying? Like if it yeah. was Hebrew or Semitic or an Israelite language or tongue that they did speak, you know what I'm saying? Some of those words would be in their language today because their language today is like Niger Congo so it's mixed but that's why you see throughout these different languages you can find remnants of these Hebrew words phrases names you know what I'm saying so yeah it seems that way it's, it's definitely likely that or it's, it's a possibility that it is or it has a connection to that because I, I do believe that they, they do claim the Hebrew tradition they do claim to have those traditions and things like that so it definitely is a possibility. You know, I believe that here's something else I wanted to add, <clears throat> excuse me, to the conversation is that um, for uh, our brothers in uh, in America, uh, I'm in North America right now, but I was born in the Caribbean. Okay. Um, what, a lot of, um, here's what I wanted to say. Um, I believe uh, if people, uh, you got to remember it's the same people they say, it's the same families, it's the same group of people just spread out throughout the world, right? But what's interesting to me is that being from the Caribbean, what a lot of people don't notice in South America, right? That, uh, for example, there's a guy named Wode Maya who's down in South America right now, and he's finding out that a lot of the people he's running into in the Guyanas and those places happen to be using some of the same, the same words <laughs> for mm -hmm. a lot of things. But not just that, but as well, and I know a lot of people know this, but, but the Creole, we speak in the Caribbean, the country where I'm from, it's almost like Haitian, but not quite. Believe it or not, we use some of the exact same words that the Akan and the Evi people are using. Literally the same, like, sentences almost, you know? Yes, like, right. Yeah, and um, as well, the last part I wanted to add, this is just food for thought, you know? And, and again, humbly, you know, I, I don't know enough to say too much, but... um. But something else I got to point out is that uh, when you're in North America, I believe a lot of people don't realize the revolutions that happened in places like the Caribbean were easier to happen compared to America, where it was such a flat, uh, such a wide land, it was hard to escape and revolt successfully, you know. But in the uh, Caribbean, there were at times way more slaves than slave owners and masters, and <laughs> so yeah, yeah, revolts yeah. would happen so often. 
So what I was going to say, the last part to this I was going to say was our last names in the Caribbean islands literally link up with a lot of those same communities, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, especially the English versions of the last names. And people say, well, you guys have slave masters last names, but let me let me put it to them this way. If we have slave masters last names, and in my country, we probably had about 20 slave masters, but yet we have 400 different last names, like, and they're matching up with the people in certain parts of like the Igbo tribe or in Ghana. There were no slave masters in Ghana and Igbo giving them the same last names that we have. Do you know what I mean? Right. So just a reminder, don't let people fool you to believe that every single person and knowing our last names worked. There's a lot of people who went with their ancestors' names that just so happened to be the same last names as those in these pla places. And my great-great-grandparents passed down uh, the information that, that they did come from these places that you do speak about in your... In a, that's why I follow your, your uh, channel, because it just makes logical sense. Right. And to kick back off what you said, you know, I always say that the... Um, the African or the Afro descendants that was shipped to the Caribbean islands, Jamaica, Haiti, and all that stuff, yeah. they were able to preserve and keep more of those African That's what I'm saying. We right. literally do some of the same things. Like we have these, these we have these strange festivals where, the, you know, we even dress the same way as you can see when you follow. Like we have these things called yeah, yeah, and and, and in, in, our, in our language. We have like, a, and we have a lot of slave documents that you guys don't have, but it's the same people. You know, we have the we have a list of the different tribes that came through mm -hmm. to this day, and we literally have like I think I heard you talking about a place called Popo or something like that, Great Popo, mm -hmm. a while back. We have people who who are called Popo because that's how they uh, identify themselves. You know what I mean? And, and we have a lot I'm of like, the, the Moroccan last names, like you will. I think I followed your EM two video last night on one of my drives and uh we have a lot of those same last names of these people and it's just uh, and they're spanish last names of course a lot of them but it's mm -hmm. not from the slave masters you know exactly exactly and even to go with what you just said again uh, even to this day there's traditions among some of the caribbeans and jamaicans they keep some of the west african yam fest and new york yeah we do we have new, that. York, yeah. new year's fest in the Caribbean, the same way that, or similar to the way it's practiced in West Africa. Yeah, we have uh, the same stuff uh, where I'm from. Uh, we have uh, something we do with cassava mm -hmm. and uh, yams and uh, something with a fish. It's a fish thing we do. I can't explain it, you know. But uh, as well, we don't celebrate a lot of these uh, same things, you know. Uh, the uh, uh, wh Where I'm from, we used to have, um, let's just say, there were churches like Catholic churches, et cetera, et cetera. And it was known in our community because we had uh, we would have pr uh, so-called priests who are of European backgrounds. But our country is all black, but we would always see these priests who were not us, you know, and right. they were leading the congregation. So what we would do was the ladies would take the kids to church, but the men would always stay home. And then we would have separate church services on a Saturday that they would not know about. So, uh, you know, it was... A lot of interesting stuff would happen that they would tell us about, and they would always tell us those people are the ones who killed Jesus. <laughs> they would point. We, so there's this big thing in the village behind the priest's back. We're like, these guys are the ones who did it. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, I feel you on that. Anyway, just food for thought, not saying a lot. You know, just wanted to, you know, at least pass a little bit of hope that we are the same people. And if y'all were not there, you would have less of the name influences from slave masters and the corruption of information, you know, um, right, the right. revolts did happen uh, in the Caribbean. This is a, uh, is documented, you know. I'll say the only thing similar to what we see in the Caribbean and stuff like that is amongst the Gullah Geechee, like that's the most. Yeah, African I understand some of what they're saying, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah, because they they the same words. They, they just, yeah. I mean, a lot of those slaves came originally from the Caribbean to the Port of Charleston, so. Yeah, it's the strangest thing, man. And um, uh, like for example, um, I think I told you this a while back. In a con language, if they have to say "I am," I saw this this uh, thing where they were trying. This guy was doing a speech on exactly what is how do you say "I am" in ancient Paleo Hebrew, and what he came up with was the same way that they say "I am," 
because some of their letters are interchangeable, like the Y's and the M's. So mm -hmm. if you Google, do a Google Translate for I am in a con or airway, it'll say Mwaye. And that's literally what we say, although we are supposed to be where I'm from, a French or an English colony, we still don't say I am or we don't say Je suis, which would be the French part. Instead, we still say Mwaye, which is the same thing. And ironically, that's the name of the uh, Lemba people. If you ask them, it's Mwaye. Or they, Mwaye is how they say Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, is the same people using the same words to describe certain things, which I find is ironic. Dang, you're going to make the black Native Americans mad, brother. Yeah, I don't give two about any of those guys. <laughs> I, I really don't care. They got to talk to my uncles, and they don't want it with them. That's the damn sure. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. Anyways, family, y'all stay well. Um, Shabbat Shalom, and we'll go talk again. All right, my brother. Shabbat Shalom. All right, sir. All right, guys, if there's any more questions, comments, or anyone wants to come up and join the stream, get some thoughts out, I'll leave the stream open a few more minutes just to see if we get any more questions or comments. If not, just be on the lookout. I'll probably break this live down into smaller segments so it can be dissected better for the people. And again, um, sometime next week, maybe Saturday, I'll release a do another live video or drop a pre-recorded video, all right? So again, I see no questions or comments, so I will get ready and wrap this up. You all enjoy the rest of you all Shabbat, and again, I will see you all soon. Shalom.